is the professional lecture series, the last of this season um, before the year ends. I'll be introducing Dr. Kathleen Smith, um, and I think she's here. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen her, but I think she's here. Yeah, she's in the room. Okay, thank you. Dr. Kathleen Smith has a PhD in counseling and became an associate faculty member at the Bowen Center for the Study of the Family in 2018. She has had a most interesting professional journey beginning academically at Harvard College, where she majored in history. Her mother died while she was in college, which she said contributed to a shift in focus and sent her more in the direction of the helping professions. She entered seminary after college, but only completed one year as she entered a counseling program in graduate school. Thinking families would be easier to tackle than congregations. While working towards her PhD in counseling at George Washington University, she met Dr. Carrie Collier, who introduced her to Bowen Theory. As an aside, Dr. Collier has recently been appointed the new executive director of the Bowen Center to begin officially in July. In 2012, Dr. Smith entered the postgraduate program at the Bowen Center. Over the years, Dr. Smith has considered herself a writer since college. She has written articles for the Tennessean, the Austin American Statesman, and several other newspapers and magazines prior to graduate school. She also has published articles in Counseling Today and Psychotherapy Networker, as well as other popular publications. In 2019, she published a book called Everything Isn't Terrible. At the Bowen Center, Dr. Smith hosts the television show Family Matters, a joint production of the University of the District of Columbia and the Bowen Center. She presented a paper titled The Hikikoman and Family Emotional Process about the hideaway youths in Japan, a fascinating family and social challenge for mostly firstborn youth. She also has a private clinical practice. Dr. Smith is an only child, married, and has an 18-month-old daughter. Tonight, she will present her thoughts on writing about Bowen theory for a popular audience. Welcome, Dr. Smith. Thank you, Anne. I appreciate that. Um, so before I start sharing slides, I just uh, to give you guys a little bit more background um, about myself, it's been interesting to observe um, shifting from academic to popular writing and how I think about that. And I don't know why so many people are interested in this topic. I don't know if it's the word popular. I don't know if people like to write. I have no idea. So <laughs> I'm definitely not going to be talking for an hour and a half tonight because I really want to hear uh, sort of what brings you all to this conversation and to this lecture and to get questions from you and hear your thinking as well. So we're definitely going to make a lot of time for that. Um, and people are going to be moderating. So just sort of write down your questions, hold your thinking um, until, uh, until I finish. And I think we'll definitely have a lot of time for discussion, which I'm looking forward to. So just to kind of give you a little bit of background, I was a terrible graduate student because I was not a great academic writer. I didn't understand why my dissertation needed to be so long. It felt like I was, I, I was required to say the same thing 10 times and it didn't make a whole lot of sense to me <laughs> because I leaned towards appreciating sort of brevity and saying things with as few words as possible. And I think that made me a poor researcher um, and a poor academic writer because I was always interested in how do I say this in the simplest way. And I think that a lot can get lost when you do that. And I, I'm going to talk about a little bit about that tonight. Um, but I, there's this m moment I remember where I had just gotten an article published in um, like a professional magazine and I had a professor who told me, you know, don't get distracted. That's not what your job is. Your job is to, <laughs> to write your dissertation, right? And I think he absolutely was right in one way, but um, you know, that was a moment where I was like, is that my job? Is that what I actually wanna do? 
And I found that I was sort of being pulled back toward the career I had had before graduate school, which was freelance writing. And I sort of was thinking about, okay, how do I fit um, what I'm learning about Bowen theory and my professional career into, into that passion? And so I'm going to talk a little bit about that tonight. But mainly I'm going to be talking about the dilemmas of writing about theory for a popular audience and the opportunities that it can present. And like I said, I'm very curious to, to hear your thinking, but I'm also going to dedicate some time talking about the emotional process as well, because this is writing is a relationship thing, right? There are other humans involved. So that emotional process is definitely there. The instincts to um, be immature, to be anxious. <laughs> are there as well. And, and I also want to spend a little bit of time ab thinking about how differentiation is related to writing and how writing can be such a, a useful practice for observing oneself. So am I able to share my screen? I'm going to try it. Uh, yes, you can do that. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. Great. So people can see this nod if you can. All right. Wonderful. So I didn't really know where to start with this lecture. You know, I was thinking about how it's nice to have a good audience because I just have to bring myself to the conversation. If, it, if there were fewer people, I'd be guessing how to, what you want to hear and how to please you. But there are too many people for that. So I have no choice but to share what's interesting to me <laughs> and to bring a little bit of, of self uh, to this. So hopefully that's what I'll do tonight. Um, so I want to start with a quote from Dr. Bowen. Uh, from Family Therapy and Clinical Practice, which is a little bit of a tongue twister, but it's always been a useful quote for me. The process of being able to observe is the slow beginning toward moving one small step toward getting oneself outside an emotional system. It is only when one can get a little outside that it is possible to begin to observe and to begin to modify an emotional system. And I, in, in, you know, my copy of the book, I have it underlined and I have the words chicken or egg, you know, in question mark, because <laughs> I understand what he's trying to get at here. And that's the challenge of it, right? To, to observe yourself, you have to be a little bit outside of, of the system, right? But to, um, to be able to observe, you have to be already outside of the system a little bit. And so my, what I take from that quote is, you know, working on differentiating a self, working on growing up. Um, and being able to write about it is kind of a chicken and an egg situation. <laughs> Writing is a great way to grow up, but if you're not doing that work on yourself, it's difficult to, to write about it. And so that's how I think, um, think about that. And I, I included this picture because from, I don't know if you all remember the famous episode of I Love Lucy where they have to translate back and forth in three or four different languages. And that's what I'm always thinking about when I'm writing or trying to write about Bowen theory is, you know, is this a game of telephone? Is the, is some of this meaning getting lost in my translation of it and my choice maybe to not use this particular um, conceptual word or this vocabulary, right? Am I butchering it in some way? So I think that's always a, a piece of the anxiety that goes along with it uh, for sure. Um, and so first of all, what's the point? You know, what's the point about trying to convey some of these ideas to people who have either never heard about Bowen theory, people who aren't clergy or clinicians or, you know, organizational leaders? Um, you know, isn't it better to just sort of say, hey, or it, you know, if you're interested in this, go read, you know, Dr. Bowen's text start there. You know, how do you um, see it being a worthwhile endeavor? And I wasn't sure where to what to think about it. And so what I did was I went to um, uh, Dr. Roberta Gilbert's book, which was actually the first book that I read when I was introduced to Bowen theory. And I read the introduction to it, which was written by Dr. Kerr. And I think it's such a wonderful, concise, to the point <laughs> description of, of the theory for somebody who has zero knowledge. And so I'd encourage you to go back and read that if you haven't read that before, you haven't read it in a while. And he said a couple of things that really stood out to me about um, what Dr. Gilbert was trying to do. And I think this is different than the type of writing that I do because I'm not trying to summarize the theory as a whole. That's not something that I've tackled or even desire to tackle. And a couple of points he made was that, you know, what's unique about Bowen theory is that it deglorifies the human by getting factual. You know, that it's actually a huge relief 
that we're not that different from other animals. At least that's how I think about it. You know, that uh, other, you know, previous um, psychotherapy theories kind of have this mystical approach to humans or treat us, you know, like we're unicorns, but we're really not, right? And so if I were to retitle this talk, it wouldn't be, you know, I'm writing about Bowen theory for a popular audience. It would be writing about humans, you know, <laughs> for a popular audience. And so much I think of what I do or what I try to do is just to relay the facts of what we do when you dial up the stress uh, in our relationship system. And, it, and that's maybe different than thinking about writing about theory, but I think that that's, that's part of it. The, the ability to write about humans factually in a way that's understandable and relatable, you know, because that's what um, the word popular means, right? It just means it's relatable or um, useful for a layperson. And the other thing that he mentioned about Bowen theory was that, you know, these patterns in the family system and in other systems, they play out in ways, I think the use, words he used were knowable, finite, universal, you know, and so if, if that's true, then anyone reading about some of these ideas or some of these, um, these observations about what humans do in family systems should go, aha, that's me, that's my family, that's, that's exactly what we do, right? So it, it should be relatable, it should be popular in that sense. And the other thing he talked about was um, that writing about it kind of uh, demystifies the theory and what it looks like when it's applied, you know, in the coaching room, in the therapy room, or, else, or elsewhere, you know, in other, other uh, professions. And I think that that's so useful because I think for a lot of people, they have absolutely no idea what happens in a therapist's office or a coach's office. <laughs> and that allows for people to get away with kind of doing whatever they want or <laughs> saying they're eclectic or just, a, you know, subscribing to a theory but not really using it, right? And I think the ability to describe a theory that in a way that a person can understand and what happens um, in that coaching session is so useful for people. And I think it's also very useful for graduate students who, at least when I was in, you know, a master's program, it was a bit of a mystery what actually happened once you got in the room with someone. You know, there were, there were a couple of videos, there were, you know, some things you could watch and read, but for the most part, you were kind of on your own and you just had to hope that you were doing what you were supposed to be doing, right? And that's one of the things I love about the Bowen Center is the, the clinical conference series that we do and this ability to kind of see the work in real time. It's so useful for clinicians. Uh, but I also think being able to write about it in a narrative way, which I try to, I've tried to do in my book and other places to describe sort of what it looks like to ask people questions and think with them as they stumble towards maturity and just sort of demystifying that is really useful. And I feel like I'm using that word a lot, but it is. Um, and the last reason I think I do it and I encourage other people to is just to be able to cast a wide net to introduce future thinkers to Bowen theory. People who aren't, you know, who've never heard of it before, people who are younger, um, people who are scientists and can do the, <laughs> can do the work and the reading that, and the writing that I cannot do or, or don't necessarily desire to do. And I think that, that that is another way that it can be a worthwhile endeavor. But I think if it's something you're interested in doing, you kind of have to ask yourself, what's the point? You know, if it's to get a certain reaction out of other people, then, you know, good luck with that. Uh, I think it's going to be a pretty miserable experience. <laughs> um, but just moving on, here are the two questions that continually plague me about writing for a popular audience about Bowen theory. And the first is that is believing that Bowen theory will never be popular, is that just distancing? You know, if, and I'm not saying this is everyone, I'm saying if this, if this is something that I'm thinking, is this is me anxious, anxiously distancing because I, I don't want to um, deal with the reaction of people who might have different thinking or who might not be amenable to the ideas, right? Um, you know, how do you, how do you stay in touch with people uh, who are, and I'm going to talk a lot about this, how do you stay in emotional contact with people who, you know, are using different theories in their work or who are um, taking an individual approach, right, to psychotherapy is, is believing that because 
a publication primarily tackles it from that way, you know, and that assuming that it won't be uh, a person won't be or an editor won't be interested in Bowen theory. Is that distancing? I don't know. I think that's a question I continue to have. And the other question I have is, is trying to make it popular giving into relationship pressure? And I think that it absolutely can be. And I'll, I'm going to talk a little bit about that in a minute too. Sort of how do you write about these ideas and your own thinking in an editorial process wh where your words are being changed? Or, this happens to me all the time. You know, I will write something and the editor just throws out a title based on their understanding and it has, it's completely wrong. You know, that's part of the process. And I have to think about what's my position when that happens and how do I respond to that, you know? And so I think you can, can kind of go either way. We can, can distance or we can kind of lose self and lose our own thinking in the, in the process of wanting to write something that's popular and well received, right? And so those are the, the two questions that I always have as I'm approaching writing for some of these audiences. It takes some. So as I mentioned before, I always like to think about what the emotional process is as a writer, because there are so many humans involved. And I think that's easy to forget when you are alone and working on something by yourself. And I think, you know, I'm going to just run through a couple of these. And then I'm really curious to hear some of your thinking when we get to, to the conversation. But the first thing I think I always have to be on the lookout for is distancing. I think it's easy to want to distance from people who are have much better knowledge and application and history of using Bowen theory than I do. It's very scary <laughs> to write something and know that someone who, you know, knows it a lot better than you do is going to be reading it. There's the anxiety of that. I think there's also distancing from um, colleagues who are using different theories and uh, you know, I think that's a, that's a challenge too, whether you are a writer or not, you know, to the anxiety of um, kind of these different ideas bumping up against each other and continuing to share that thinking and have contact with people in a way that's not, you know, aggressive or trying to manage or control their reactions or their thinking, right, is always difficult. Um, I think there can be a tendency to want to distance from publications, like I said before, that take an individual approach. If you're reading a magazine or a website, you know, or a, a professional magazine, you know, and they tend to publish things that are very individual and focused, I think the, the automatic is res response is to say, oh, they're not interested in Bowen theory, so I'm just not going to go there, right? And also, I think distancing from the people who read your work, you know, I think you have to determine how often you want to reply to people. That doesn't mean you reply to every comment or every thought, every thought, but it is useful to pay attention to and to notice when you are anxiously distancing from people trying to engage with your work and, and what that's about. And I'm also constantly thinking about how to navigate the triangles, you know. I'm trying to think of a couple examples. I wrote them down. Let me look. <laughs> You know, there's definitely one between me and the reader and the editor. And there's one between me as a writer and people who know about Bowen theory and people who don't. And I think there's one between me and, uh, you know, professionals who aren't Bowen trained clinicians and people who are, you know, there are just so many. And <laughs> I think um, being in contact with all of those people is, is a challenge, you know, and I think it's so easy to adopt the thinking of one side of the triangle against the other. It's just so automatic. And I think about how many of my uh, thoughts about how to write about Bowen theory, how to engage with professional publications were just adopted without thinking, without examining my own mind. It's, it's so automatic, and I think that that's useful to pay attention to, for sure. And then the one I struggle with the most is just over-functioning for the reader. I think, you know, the, 
the instinct is to want to explain everything they could possibly be thinking about or to cram the entire theory into a thousand words or into a blog post or, a, you know, an email. And that's, that's impossible to do. Right. And I think, um, there's some anxiety that goes al along with not doing it. And I'm going to talk a little bit about my process in a minute, but, you know, reminding myself that readers are capable, you know, that people are able to seek more information if they're interested, if they want it, you know, I have to be truthful about what I'm trying to present. And, you know, if I need to say, this isn't everything that there is to know about this theory, this is one little snippet. Right. Uh, but I think it's easy to want to, Overfunction in that capacity. I think another way that I tend to overfunction is to want to over explain or manage people's reactions. I'm pretty good about not arguing with comments. Um, but I will get emails from people sometimes that and it's just so fascinating. <laughs> how distressed a stranger can make me. Uh, that's the beautiful thing about technology, right? Just instantly. And you know, I noticed it a lot right when uh, coronavirus was starting. You know, it was all of a sudden, it was just the people's responses to me. They were just so anxious. And I was having to remind myself that there were so many more variables that they were responding to than just what I had written, right? And that was useful for me. But being able to ask myself, you know, is my response about getting clear about my thinking or communicating that thinking to this person or is it just me about calming trying to calm things down as quickly as possible and make this person happy or have good comeback or whatever right and if it's the latter then i don't think that that's necessarily something i need to be able um, to do so you know those are just, just a few examples of how i see the emotional process at work i think you know another one is um trying to mind read and I talked about that at the beginning, you know, trying to guess what people want to hear or what's going to make someone happy or unhappy, right? And then to adjust the writing to get that particular outcome. And that's such a maddening process. And I think the, the more I can kind of step away from that, the better. And I think that is one benefit of writing to a larger audience is that it's just impossible to do. Whereas if you're just writing to a, a group of colleagues, right, it's a little bit easier to maybe guess what they want to hear. And so one thing I always uh, do with my clients and with myself is to just take some notes about my immature functioning and to notice what they are and to begin to, like Dr. Bowen said, to observe and to get myself a little bit outside of that emotional system if I can. And these are just a few things that I have noticed um, in, my, <laughs> in my writing career that I will tend to do. And I think it's useful if you're, you know, if this interests you to maybe do that for yourself, to sit down and ask, if I write as anxiously as possible, what does that look like? What am I doing? What am I not doing? And to have a real clear sense of what those behaviors might be. And so here's some of mine. First, it's just to distance from people to avoid negative reactions. And I already talked about that. Uh, the second is agreeing or giving in to calm down a relationship. I think that is so easy to do with editors because if you want someone to ask you to write for them again, if you want someone to hire you, uh, the tendency is to want to say, yeah, that change you made is totally fine. You know. Um, when maybe it isn't and maybe isn't being honest to the the theory or to your thinking right and i think that's very easy to do you know the flip side of that is to want to um kind of arbitrate every little thing right so you have to kind of make the decision of you know what's really important what do i not need to not let go and i need to be in contact about and what's you know what's just something i'm gonna have to let let go this time the next thing is just to pull other people before knowing my own mind, you know, and I think that applies to so much more than writing, but how quick we are, we are to borrow the thinking of others before taking the time to define our own thinking. You know, I'm trying to think of an example of how I might do that. You know, I think sometimes I might ask people, you know, I write like a weekly newsletter and I sometimes will ask people, what do you want to hear about? What, tell me what you think I should write about this week. And the problem with that is you will get a thousand different answers, right? And 
<laughs> you know, but if I take the time and say, well, what am I curious about this week? What has been useful to me to think about with myself, with my clients? And if I bring that curiosity to the writing, then hopefully other people will be interested in it as well. But if, if it's just me trying to appease what's been asked of me or what I've, you know, what I've been asked to write, I think that definitely comes through in the writing. And the fourth thing, I, I already talked about this as well, but just lecturing the reader. You know, I, that's one thing I always do when I write is I reread it. And in addition to sort of editing and cutting things, I will, ed, I will take out anything that sounds preachy. And I'm sure some preachiness still definitely <laughs> makes its way through. Uh, but if I am sort of directing someone or sounding, you know, very um, authoritative in that way, I just cut it out because I don't think it's, it's useful for people. And I think that that's a, a challenge with um, right, working with editors and with popular publications is because, especially in the psychotherapy world, you know, the most common thing I get when I'm asked to be interviewed or write something is, well, can you give us a, a tool? We need a five minute exercise. <laughs> you know, can you just tell, can you, I know you're not supposed to, but can you just tell them what they should do? You know, and that's the constant struggle of this is what I'm talking about is not a five minute exercise. You know, it, it just isn't. And I'm not going to make something up to <laughs> appease you when that, that doesn't exist with this type of thinking, right? And so that can be a hard thing as well, but it's very easy to want to give in and do that in the moment and, and direct the reader and say, just do this and you'll be fine. Uh, and I mentioned this before too, but assuming a reader is incapable of seeking out more information. And I think that's so useful in your own editing process to pay attention and ask, you know, okay, if I'm talking about this concept or this idea, you know, do I really need to go into this detail? Is there a simpler way of saying it? Does it even need to be in here at all? Am I just, am I just feeling anxious that I haven't said anything about the family diagram? So I need to just throw this paragraph in here because someone might be upset with me if I don't mention how important the family diagram is, right? Um, you know, and, and I think that that's important to, to recognize is that uh, if you have sort of outlined what the purpose is of your writing, and I think for me, especially my purpose a lot of the time is to introduce people to ideas that will lead them to learn more about theory. It's not to teach them theory or to summarize theory. And I think that that is, it's just to describe what humans do when they're anxious. And that your purpose might be different, but that is my purpose a lot of the time. And if I can remember that, then I will have a better chance of not straying into to this sort of overfunctioning or assuming that a person can't educate themselves more if they want to. Another immature thing, I don't, I don't do this as much, but I think it's easy sometimes to want to argue with critics or say, you know, that's not what I said. Um, I get hilarious emails from people who, <laughs> they, they're not criticizing me, but they sent something I wrote to someone else and they criticized. It. And so they're like, well, look what this terrible thing someone said. How, how should I respond to like to defend that this is okay? And I'm thinking, you know, it's a triangle, right? It, <laughs> it just happens so automatically. Uh, and I think sometimes it's just kind of saying, you know what, you, you can decide how you want to respond or that's okay. You know, I don't really have any thoughts for them is, is an okay thing too. And the last thing which I think is so easy to do is to throw around jargon I absolutely don't understand. And I think that's so easy for people when they are learning the theory to begin to just sort of parrot back words that they hear without taking the time to sit down and see how Dr. Bowen defined them, how other people have defined them, how they would define them. And that's such a useful writing practice too, is can you say it in a different way? Can you say it with fewer words? I mean, there is the dilemma of what gets lost when you do that. And I'd love to talk about that with folks tonight if you have thoughts. But, um, you know, if, do you understand every word that you've used? And if not, you need to get a little bit clearer with yourself uh, about what some of those words mean. And are they even necessary, I think, is a, is a useful question. All right. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about my approach every week and sort of how I've developed a practice of writing and how it sort of relates to, to working on myself or thinking about myself and my family and other relationship systems. And I don't know if you, I'm sure you all have heard of the writer Anne Lamott. You know, she wrote a wonderful book called Bird by Bird about writing and, you know, 
it's very popular and I've read it many times. And one of the things she mentions when she's writing a novel is that she uh, imagines a one inch picture frame and she only has to describe what can be contained in that one inch frame. And this is what I try to do. I don't know if you can ask the question, what a theory can I put in a one inch frame? I don't know if that's possible or not. But what I try and ask myself is, you know, what's a one inch frame of what I've been thinking about this week in my relationships or what I've been thinking about with clients? What's one phrase, one sentence, one idea that I want to kind of sit down and riff on for a little bit? And if it goes nowhere, that's completely fine. But that's my starting point. It's not a concept. It's not, um, you know, some of these bigger ideas. It's not, like I said, trying to summarize the theory. It's just sort of teasing one idea out and seeing where it goes and whether it has anything to do with Bowen theory or not. And I think that helps me get a little bit clearer about whether it does. And, you know, I think another process that I uh, adopted when I wrote my book and, and have done other writing is that I make it a habit to be reading, you know, from Dr. Bowen's book or, or other people's books, you know, and it doesn't necessarily have to be what I'm choosing to write about or what I'm writing about, but it's just the process of using that part of my brain. And what I do is I take uh, index cards and I jot down notes uh, about different concepts, different ideas. And it's not about what's on the um, cards or what chapter I'm reading. It's about engaging that front part of the brain, <laughs> being curious. And that kind of shifts my focus I think a little bit away from what do people want to read about, what's going to get a good response, and more towards what's interesting, what's useful to think about. And then when my brain is in that place, it's so much easier to take that other thread that I pulled from my work with clients or my work on myself and kind of run with it. And I just found it to be a really useful exercise. I'm sure there are other ways of, of doing that. But I think, you know, I'll talk a little bit about the pro programs at the Bowen Center in a little bit, but I think if you're not meeting with a coach or reading and taking notes or engaged in a program, it's incredibly difficult, if not possible, to sit down and have any useful thought about some of these ideas. And so I think that that weekly habit of being engaged in some way is really useful. Uh, yeah, and the other thing I try and do is what I mentioned at the beginning, to stick to that that universality and the no, the knowableness, I don't even know if that's a word, of anxiety and just to describe, just describe the facts, to describe what humans do. Like I said, when you dial up the stress, uh, sometimes in a way that's narrative and sometimes in a way that isn't. And uh, I think the closer I can stay to that, the better chance I have of writing something that's, that's useful or curious. And then, like I said, I try and edit out jargon. I try and edit out the preachiness, I always try and make everything shorter. And that can be a difficult process, but I think it's it's really important to say things, you know, as succinctly as possible. And I think that's a useful practice, whether it, you're writing for a popular audience or not. You know, if you're, if you are writing, you know, like an, an abstract or something that's describing a talk you're giving, you know, can you cut it in half? Is that possible? You know, I think maybe not, but I think it's a very useful practice um, to kind of get your brain into to, to defining your thinking um, with as few words as you can. All right. So I think writing is useful to think about in relationship to differentiation of self because there is an individual component and there is a relationship component as well to writing. And, you know, the individual component is, can you articulate what you really think in writing? You know, one question I have myself, for myself always is, are you really working on yourself? Are you really growing up if you can't describe what it is that you're doing differently in your family? <laughs> I, I think yes. I think if you, or no, I think if you can't do it, then maybe you're not actually making any progress, you know? And so I think challenging yourself to be able to write about what you have done, what you have tried to do, 
what you have failed to do in relationship to others is so great. And it's so useful prior to, you know, meeting with your coach, meeting with your therapist, and it puts your brain in that place of, I guess what you bring to the session is less about the anxiety of the moment and more about the actual thinking that you've done and what you're curious about and the facts, right? And it helps you be more objective. And so I think it's such a useful practice in that sense. And then the relationship, you know, component is, can you share this thinking with others without trying to manage the reaction? And that's very, very difficult to do. And I think it's useful to observe all the ways that you do try to manage the reaction, whether it's avoiding the reaction, trying to convince or control or lecture, you know, <laughs> trying to mind read, trying to anticipate people or how people are going to react and appease them, right? Giving in, uh, adapting to calm things down, right? All of the predictable things that we do uh, to, to calm down a relationship, right? To manage the, the distress that we feel. And I think that um, you have to think about that and you have to be conscious of that because you will be very anxious if you are not. Let's see what else I had. Yeah, and I think what's great about writing to a wider audience is that, like I said before, you can't make everyone happy. It's so, it's so freeing to know that, you know, I always give the example of when I got married, it, I had this moment where I realized that all of these people had gathered who knew different parts of myself. And it was just like, all of my pseudo self was like so apparent in that moment because there was nothing I, there was no one I could be <laughs> to make all everyone happy. I couldn't be all of those selves all at the same time. Right. So I just had to just kind of, you know, do the best I could and, and, be the, you know, most solid version of myself. But I, that's how I think about my writing too, because there are so many people who want different things and who are going to have different reactions. And I think recognizing that can help you get back to, to what you actually think and what you actually um, believe, you know, and I think that's helpful. All right, I'm going to wrap up in just a few minutes because I do want to give you all a lot of time for questions if you have them. And so, you know, I think whether you want to write for a popular audience or not, I think writing about your work on yourself is a wonderful practice. You know, there's the research about how, you know, writing uses a lot of the same neural pathways as meditation. Um, you know, writing helps you. I talk a lot in my writing about how do you tell a story without villains, without heroes, without victims, right? Because we're narrative creatures. We want to have those elements in how we talk about ourselves and how we talk about our family. So being able to write about your family um, without doing that is a challenge. And I think it's such a great practice as well To And it helps you just get a little bit more objective and, you know, and like Dr. Bowen said, get a little bit outside of that emotional system. And yeah, I think um, it's just one, one more way of defining oneself in, you know, and I think it's so related to differentiation because like I said, there is that individual component and there is that relationship component. And I think we trick ourselves into thinking that it's an individual, that it's solely an individual thing when it isn't. And I think the more you can be aware and think about the emotional process in your writing, uh, the better chance you have at, at, um, at not doing what you do to just calm things down. So here are a few questions I want to leave you all with. Um, and hopefully if you have thoughts or, or answers, I'm happy to hear them in the discussion. The first is just, like I just said, you know, how does relationship pressure influence your writing process? Can you get really honest with yourself about that and not beat yourself up so much about it, you know, just to recognize that that's what humans do, right? And that's what, uh, that's what you're up against. And how do you initiate and maintain emotional contact between yourself and other Bowen thinkers or Bowen theory thinkers, uh, between people who don't know about the theory and who might have their own reactions to it. You know, what is, what is your responsibility there and what does that look like? And how do you incorporate writing into your work on self? You know, is it a daily habit? Is it a weekly habit? Do you sit down at the end of every year and talk about, you know, what you managed to do and what, what you weren't able to do and how, um, how you were able to observe and get a little bit more curious about your family. 
I think that's such a great, um, great tradition for a lot of people to have and to think about what that could look like uh, for you and how that is a piece of, of staying curious and staying objective about yourself. So before we take questions, just a few plugs. So if you want to read my weekly newsletter, you can just go to my website, KathleenSmith.net and subscribe there. All the old ones are posted there too. Um, and like I said before, I think it's so important to be plugged into a program or plugged into thinking, you know, there are so many great programs around the country, around the world. I'm in DC, you know, I had the, the fortune of coming to the, to the Bowen Center and, you know, my, I jumped into the postgraduate program and it was just so useful for me and for my writing. And, you know, the Bowen Center this uh, upcoming year is starting an intro to the theory course. I don't know if there are too many people here tonight who, who would be at that level. But uh, if you're interested in it or, you know, people who are, um, there's some info on the website about that. And then people who have been doing the online program, which is now going to be called the Continuing Studies Program. Um, it, we've gotten such, Carrie has done that and we've gotten such a great response to that. And so that's an option as well for people who want to, who have some background, but want to continue their thinking, you know, and then there's also the postgraduate program, which for the time being, you know, is going to be meeting virtually because of COVID, but possibly will um, go back to meeting uh, in person at the Bowen Center in the future. But if you're really curious and you want to hop on and do some thinking tomorrow, uh, Amy Post is going to be doing our clinical conference tomorrow, which is going to be really interesting. And the title, which I've written down, is Family Response to Challenging Times, which is obviously incredibly relevant to everything we're up against right now. So, you know, what I love about the clinical conference series is it, it does that demystifying work, right? I remember the the first ones I ever attended, I just furiously wrote down every question that the clinician asked because <laughs> it was so useful to have examples of what questions actually get asked in a coaching session, which was really helpful for me. Um, and you know, the other free resources are every lecture we've done on these Thursday night lectures is available on the Bowen Center's podcast if you want to go back and listen to any of them. And then also all of the episodes of Family Matters interviews um, with uh, Bowen Theory thinkers are on YouTube and that's through the Bowen Center's uh, YouTube channel, which you can check out. And obviously, if this feels very overwhelming and there are too many things, you can also just sign up for our uh, weekly newsletter at thebowencenter.org slash newsletter to get updates about all these wonderful events. So I'm going to stop there. Let me escape. Uh, it looks like Laura Brooks has a question. Sorry if I missed somebody before her. I wasn't looking in the right place. Oh, okay, so I thought this was really interesting. Um, and so, so you really got me thinking about the obstacles to being a good writer. And um, yeah, I always thought that, you know, I was just not a good writer, you know, but this idea of how much this relationship piece gets in the way of clear thinking and clear writing. And, um, uh, you know, I was sort of aware of that, but you've really just uh, laid that out so clearly um, in your presentation. Um, it also got me thinking about um, writers who are not writing about bowling theory, but generally, you know, people who write. Um, I'm just wondering if you're kind of implying that um, that writers who tend to be just really good writers generally, I mean, just completely separate from Bowen, um, any focus on Bowen theory, are those who are able to really manage this relationship piece of it in a way that's effective? I don't know, Laura, that's such a good question. <laughs> <laughs> because I think about so many writers who are incredibly anxious, at least from the, the, the facts, right? <laughs> One would think that, um, you know, so I don't know, is it self, is it pseudo self? Are they just getting the right boosts of confidence and calmness from the right people and that they've been able to function because of that? I have no idea, you know? Um, but I think um, in the long term, you know, to, to be able to do it across a lifetime 
you really have to be able to manage the relationship piece because at least from my experience, you know, I wrote, um, I've written two books and the first one, which did not have anything to do with bone theory. Um, I was just so anxious through the whole process and no matter what happened, successes or failures, I was just incredibly miserable and distressed the entire time. And I think it was because of that relationship piece. It was me trying to guess what people wanted or calm them down or make them happy. And that was me sort of adapting and giving in, right? And it made me very symptomatic and very miserable. And so I think I've gotten a, a little bit better at doing that, but I think recognizing that, um, you don't have to be in contact with people for it to be a relationship issue, right? right? I mean, I've, we all know that, right? <laughs> and I think it's true for writing, even if the, you don't know your audience or you're trying to impress people you went to high school with or something. I don't know, but that's, it's a relationship thing, right? And it's just useful to, to remember. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Amy, Gullickson, sorry if I'm pronouncing your last name wrong. It's okay, Gullickson is pretty Gullickson. good. Okay. Yeah, hi, thanks, this is really fascinating. Um, I'm an academic by trade, but in evaluation. Um, and it, I think what you've said about writing is true in terms of the relational aspects. As you were talking, I was thinking about, um, for us, we always have to think about our audience when we're writing and how we present findings or whatever. Um, but I was thinking about what I've learned from Bowen theory, which is about how do you, how do you communicate in a way that makes it more likely the other person will hear what you're saying? Um, not necessarily as a compromise of self, but as an understanding that the other person has their own stuff happening and trying to make what you're thinking more clear to someone in whatever space they happen to be in. So I'd be curious to hear uh, what you think about that. Yeah, I think that's uh, an interesting question. You know, I, I think it's partially why I use a lot of questions in my writing, because I feel like, first of all, I think that curiosity, you know, lends itself and helps people be a little bit more reactive <laughs> as they're reading it, because it's a question, not a statement, right? Yeah. But also I think it's why I stop and try and edit out anything that is my attempt at managing the reaction. You know, if it's saying something like, well, you know, it's funny because we were all taught in school, you know, you write the five paragraph essay, you imagine what uh, objections a person might have, and then you, yeah. and then you address those, right? And that's not, a, that's not always the best approach, right? To sort of anticipate uh, how a person might be reactive and then try to like, calm them down or convince them that you're right. I mean, it's, it, I understand that there's a place for it. And it, you know, if you're writing an academic article, you do have to think about what some of those things are. But if I catch myself sort of leaning too much in that direction, uh, I'm, I'm have a good sense that, you know, people aren't going to be able to find it useful or they're not going to be able to understand me, like you said, you know, so those are just two things I could think of off the top of my head is just asking questions and editing out the the preaching the, or the, the managing. Preaching. Yeah. Yes, those are universally, I think, not welcome, the preaching bits. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Kathleen Colley. Thanks, Kathleen. Um, one of the things that came through so clearly to me was your idea about having uh, knowing what your purpose is. And it was so true to theory, the idea of having principles in any situation in life and about yourself. And the way you described that was just very clear that when anxiety can distract a writer going in every different direction to get back to what am I writing for? What is my purpose? Um, that just came through really clearly. Um, I also think, I was thinking the relationship piece of it for me is that uh, the first time I wrote a chapter, I was asked to do it. I don't know that I would have done it on my own. And I gave a, a brief five minute uh, presentation and the man that was organizing the meeting said, would you write a chapter for this book? 
And I was like a deer in the headlights. I mean, I looked at him and thought, well, why is he asking me this? Because I knew that I should write, but I hadn't done it. So I said, yes. And two days later, I left on a scuba diving trip and I was so anxious and I thought, I can't go diving underwater if I'm this anxious. So I took my notes with me and I would go diving. I would come up and I would write. I would go diving. I would come up and I would write. And I had that chapter almost completely done by the time I, I was done with my vacation. Some would say that was not a vacation. But for me, it was someone had asked me to do something. And was I really going to do this on my own steam or not? And I would say I began by not doing it on my own steam. And that would be an example of a relationship piece. But then it gave me the confidence to, to keep going. So I think your, your focus tonight on relationship pieces are, there's so many of them. There's so many layers to them. And it really um, brought it into focus how important it is for us to think about that all the time. Even when we're working on self, of course, in our family and uh, with our colleagues to how distracting it can be to just start thinking of what other people are thinking and to get off our own game. So thanks. It was a really great um, broad view of with a lot of questions that I have after listening. Thank you, Kathleen. And thank you for that example. It made me think of one of mine when I was first starting on my most recent book. I went, I got uh, the opportunity to go to a writer's colony for two weeks and how I was, you know, I was in the zone. I was bright, cranking out so much. I thought it was great. And I emailed it to my agent. And as soon as I sent that email, it became relation <laughs> a relationship problem, right? A relationship challenge. Not that it wasn't before, but I just wasn't thinking about that, right? And it was more about me and my own curiosity. But as soon as I involved another human, my perspective just dramatically changed, you know? And the reality was probably somewhere in the middle, right? It wasn't great, but it wasn't terrible either. And, but, uh, you know, involving another human made it that much more difficult to be objective about like what I could do and what I couldn't do. And it was just fascinating. Fortunately, I was able to recognize that, but it was so fascinating to see how quickly involving another person's eyes on it just made me sick you know, and, and I think that, that that's it's so easy. Uh, uh, it happens so easily. So thank you. Oh, somebody help me out. I, I saw that there were three participants that had their hand raised. How do I see who those are? Because they just disappeared. I'm so not Oh, Zoom savvy. Um, no problem. Um, Vincent Fitzgerald. Okay. Thinking about how it just came to mind that there were about four or five different ways my own immaturity has been reflected in my writing in the time that I started writing. I think some of that's due to the fact that I've written creative nonfiction pieces for a while and been published in different things. And all those pieces are usually written very poignantly and painfully about family and dragged in other people, which creates a lot of family reaction and has sort of almost kind of pushed me away from that kind of writing. As I do mental health writing, what you've got me thinking about is the different ways my own immaturity kind of comes out in terms of just that kind of writing. So for example, um, the idea that using jargon, as I'm thinking about it now, can be easily a way of sort of borrowing self and you know, inflating myself a little bit into a pseudo self place. Um, but also I think about the ways in which having my own blog has been a way for me to try to like, use the blog in an, an actual triangle to try and get messages to people either in my own family or people who I've known by writing about things that have happened, not just from my own perspective, my own role, but things that have happened between us, which it's, you know, happens has happened quite a few times actually um and also i think the idea of trying to please every single person for whom i'm writing and just how exhausting and impossible it is and how it's made writing unpleasurable so thank you for all of that and really helping me to underscore where my own immaturities have come out and also thank you for your, for your book because it's such a accessible tool and wonderfully written i appreciate it 
Thank you, Vincent. Um, yeah, I mean, you brought up two points. I didn't even talk about writing about family, which is like, it's a whole other, <laughs> you could have a different lecture about that. And I don't, um, my family members either aren't aware or it's not a, like I'm hiding it from them. It's just, it's, they're just older and they're not on the internet and they just don't see things, right? I mean, they have my book, so I guess technically they could read it if they wanted to. Not that I talk a lot about my family in my book um, or they're, they're fine with it. So that hasn't been as much of a challenge for me, but I think it definitely, you know, brings so much reactivity to the process. Uh, but I, like, I liked what you said about, um, I don't know if you can be in a triangle with a blog or with a book, but it did make me think about how I actually, I don't ask the people I work with to read things that I've written um, because I think, I don't know, that's trying to get them to do something, which I don't feel like is ever particularly useful <laughs> or effective. Um, and I think uh, if my, you know, I think I'm stumbling over my words here. If my own thinking can't come out in our conversation, then I'm not sure <laughs> is going to be any more helpful. Uh, if they happen to find it and they've already read some things about bone theory, that's great. I mean, that's wonderful. I appreciate that. But it's not something that I ask people to do. And other people might feel differently about that. But it's not something that uh, has occur even occurred to me to ask people to do. So I don't know. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Victoria Harrison's next. Hang on, we're having issues unmuting. Tabby, are you able, able to mute her? I think we were unmuting at the same time. Okay. <laughs> I just unmuted. Got it, all right, okay. great. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Kathleen. I, uh, I think you just, in your discussion with Vincent, addressed something I was curious about. I, I was curious about how your family reacts to your writing and thinking and how you have um, navigated that. I, I was thinking about my own very puny efforts at writing and that the articles that I write for the publication that we, the quarterly publication out of my nonprofit in Houston, my brother and my father and my daughter are all subscribers. So in the back of my mind when I'm writing an article, especially if it's related to family, is that family's gonna read this. And that does help me stay kind of honest, if not inhibited in the, in the triangle that I'm writing. And, and I was, very curious about how you uh, navigate the family reading your work or being in your head as you're writing the work that you write. That was one of my questions. Anything you'd add on that? Yeah, well, I, I mean, my first thought out is I get out so lucky. You know, I only have one parent living. I'm an only child, you know. <laughs> I've got it pretty good. You know, there aren't as many people involved. There aren't as many landmines as folks with siblings, I think. <laughs> and my daughter can't read. So, you know, those things I think certainly help. So, um, you know, I think it'll be a challenge for me in the future. But right now it's not something I've come up against as much. But, you know, what I was thinking about is I was reading um, in Dr. Bowen's book, the chapter on differentiation, where he sort of gives this brief narrative of his own family. And these very definitive statements about people and their capabilities. And, and I'm, as I'm reading this, I'm just thinking, did these people, did they ever read this? You know, what was their response to his, um, his attempt to be objective about his family? And maybe you have an answer for that because I was very curious as I was reading that. <laughs> yes. I, I think that um, it's going to be a treasure trove of, of reading and appreciating how much writing was a part of Dr. Bowen's work on differentiation when we have access to more of his letters in the archives at the National uh, 
uh, Museum of the History of Science section of NLM. I've had a chance to read some of them um, in helping archive his material, but the, the letters that Clarence Boyd collected into his collected letters illustrate how much Bowen was using writing to define self with family and with anybody and everybody who crossed his path. It was a central method, I think, for him to work on defining himself and interacting with people uh, on paper. It's, it's a rich heritage that you are following, I think. Um, what was I, I was, no, I, I think the, <laughs> I won't add anything else there. You have a good lineup of, of blue hands, but thank you, thank you. Thanks. Okay, Alicia's next. Thank you for jumping in. <laughs> Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, oh, hi. Right. Um, I was really curious about the connection between the reading and the writing and the understanding. It's, um, I wonder if you could talk more about that. Um, it's, I just feel like it's really connected to, the, um, um, as Victoria was saying, a, a defining of self. Um, I, listening to you, I think in the past, I've just thought, well, I should know this sort of, sort of stuff and I have to put everything in what I'm saying so everybody will understand what I'm saying. But, and the, um, the, the reading and taking notes on, on, um, on um, cards, I thought, um, so every time you read, you take notes on cards. Is that, is that right? I mean, not every time, but it's a, it is a practice that I try and keep up and it's, it's, they're just index cards everywhere and it's a, it's a little bit of a disaster, but mm -hmm. it's sort of almost like kind of shuffling a deck. Like if I don't know where to start and I need to feel like I need to write about something, I just take a big stack of cards and I just start shifting through. And if I see a point that's interesting or something I want to think more about, yeah, I might not necessarily write about it, but I will kind of put it to the side because I think with some, you know, especially with, um, Dr. Bowen's work, it can feel incredibly overwhelming, you know, and you're not sure where to start or <laughs> to reread again to jump in the middle, you know, and if, and I think flipping through with different ideas, you know, I always reference like pages and things. So I'm not, if I want to open up a book, I can, but just sort of seeing little diagrams and, and notes and quotes that I've written, it kind of gets it. Um, like I said, it's, it's not so much about the, the topics as it is getting my brain attuned to something I'm naturally curious about as okay. opposed to figuring out what is interesting or entertaining that people want to read about, which I think is where my, it's easy for your brain to be at that place a lot of the time. Right. And mm -hmm. so that kind of shifts me, shifts me out of that. And it's just kind of a useful practice to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. If that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Becky's next. Here we go. Um, I really appreciated uh, your thoughts tonight, Kathleen. Um, I'm a, I write a column for our newspaper and I've been doing it for about 20 years and, um, and also, you know, have been studying Bowen theory. So it's kind of nice to bring those two worlds together. But, you know, I think where I get stuck is that first question I ask is what am I going to write about? So I really like that you've shared some nice ideas about how to get clear about what you're interested in. And, you know, being aware of the triangles, you know, what, what are other people expecting me to write about um, versus what is it that I'm interested in. But I'd be curious in knowing a little bit more about how long it takes you to put something like this together, because I think that's the one thing I find so daunting that sometimes the writing, um, when you're writing a, a, a column or you're writing, you know, something, um, I mean, there are deadlines that you have to meet and there's certain words counts that you have to abide by. And I just find myself uh, overwhelmed with, oh my gosh, this is just going to take so much time and I'm not going to be able to, um, I don't have the time to, to do this right now and putting it off. And um, I'm just curious about your own process. You know, how long does it take to put something like that together? And how are you, are you doing the diving in and diving out? <laughs> are you just drilling down in one sitting or um, just interested in your thoughts? 
Yeah, well, I think um, my situation, like having a toddler, like I don't have a whole lot of time. So I think the normal like hemming and hawing I would have done in the past is sort of like, okay, well, I just, I only have two hours to do this. So it's now or never. I mean, that certainly helps the pressure of that. But I think, you know, what I, what kind of helps me jump into it and get started is I, you know, and th- this is just my own process, but I don't start at the beginning. I usually start by just asking questions. You know, usually if I, like if I'm writing my newsletter or something, I try and end with questions and sometimes I'll start with them, just useful questions to think about this related to this topic. And then the other thing I do is I just start listing behaviors because that, like I said, the purpose of the writing I try to do is to get factual about how humans and how families act in when you introduce anxiety right and so that's easy for me to do like writing a a great paragraph not easy but sitting down and listing 10 things that I do you know x is uh, is a great way to start you know and or client behaviors that I've noticed you know and um or sometimes that's another way I'll approach it is if I think about a conversation I had with somebody that I've worked with and I want to get clearer about something I wasn't able to be clear about with them, you know, to sit down and, uh, you know, I, I feel like I quote Anne Lamott too much, but I think it's one of her quotes that's like, you know, say it and then say it like you're talking to a five-year-old or a golden retriever. And that's like, obviously you can't do it, <laughs> but that's the joke, right? Is to, to write it and then say it again, you know, more simply, which I'm sure, you know, as a writer, but, uh, but yeah, starting with questions and starting with facts and observations is usually how I kind of jump into it as opposed to just starting at the beginning and, and figuring out, you know, what direction I'm going to take. That usually helps me, um, helps me with it. Thank you. Um, next up is Jonathan. Hi, Kathleen. Uh, thanks so much uh, for, for being here tonight. Um, one of the questions that I had, this might be a little bit more of a uh, kind of practical question. Um, one of the things that I, I wrestle with sometimes in my practice when I'm working with kind of sharing Bowen um, theory with my clients is just the, the amount of vocabulary that's very unique to Bowen. Um, you know, just a wide variety of terms. Um, and, it's, and, and it can be really easy for clients to get kind of caught up in the jargon. I'm wondering if you have any, you know, kind of specific, um, I mean, maybe the word I would use would be like translations almost that you found helpful or helpful analogies. I know that might be a little bit more practical um, in terms of writing, but just things or maybe pitfalls that you've seen where things maybe haven't translated really well and that you might want to suggest avoiding um, in your writing. Yeah, I don't, I mean, I don't use jargon when I work with clients. I don't, I, I mean, I, I, maybe I do occasionally. I did a whole lot at the beginning. Um, and, you know, I mean, some people do, I guess some people don't, I don't. And mm-hmm. other than maybe talking about triangles, I feel like maybe that's the only one that I use, but I definitely mm-hmm. do have certain words that I use. Like, uh, instead of reactivity, I'll say like allergic. You know, that's okay. something that people, <laughs> people can relate to really quickly, right? And it maybe doesn't exactly mean the same thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think that's why writing about it is so useful because you start to kind of develop these little metaphors and ways of, of summarizing some of the ideas that you can use again with mm-hmm. clients. Like one of the ones I use in my book and that I use with um, – clients is I talk, you know, I work with a lot of young people who aren't that interested in working or talking about their families or thinking about their families. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Like they have other problems, you know, they're, maybe they'll be curious about their families as they get older. And, you know, (laughs) one of the analogies I use is I talk about um, athletes who uh, train, who Olympic athletes who try train at higher elevations to sort of, I don't know the science of it to, um, to sort of make them better prepared to compete. Right. And I talk about how working on, you know, if I were using jargon, you know, I'd say, you know, working on the unresolved emotional attachment, you know, with your parents or in your family is useful because if you can do it there, you can do it anywhere. Right. But I don't say Mm. that. I say it's like, you know, calling your mom more talk, you know, working on managing yourself in that relationship. Is that, is that 
Olympic training, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> so you'll be able to do it with your boss. You'll be able to do it like at, at work with your boyfriend or girlfriend, right? And that's just one mm-hmm. example of how I kind of think about a concept and describe it in a different way. And I have yeah. that because I use that in writing. Okay. And so I think it's an interesting practice to think about, you know, is there a metaphor? Is there a different word I can use? Mm-hmm. You know, that maybe I wouldn't use if I were, you know, writing about theory or talking about it with colleagues, but that could be really useful for a client. So, mm-hmm. you know, because I think people do get overwhelmed with the vocabulary. Absolutely. And um, the other thing that people do is they go and talk about it with their families and their fa- <laughs> their families will know very quickly, right? That they're, they're they think that their therapist is meddling if the person spouts out a vocabulary word, right? So, <laughs> uh, so I think it could be useful to, to challenge when you're doing that and think about, uh, is there a simpler or better way to say it? So, mm-hmm. yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Next up is Mary Beth Ayello. I don't think she knows she's, can you unmute her? Yeah. Um. Oh. <laughs> Abby, um, are you able to unmute? Sorry, you're, uh, you're on, you're, you're, you yourself are on mute. Hi, Hi, Mary Beth, we didn't hear anything you said. We all and have to start brilliant. over. <laughs> it was brilliant what I said. <laughs> I'm sure it was. Could, do you mind uh, repeating yourself? <laughs> Well, one thing that I have noticed from your newsletters and from your book is that your use of humor and the fact that you're, you communicate theory through down-home um, examples. And I think that, can you speak to that a little bit? What kind of a reaction do you get from that? Not only in your books, but also in your lectures. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't, I, I mean, I think uh, humor is used a lot in Bowen theory, and I've, I, you know, d- certainly Dr. Bowen used it, and even though I didn't know him, but what I've seen, he certainly did, and other people do as well, you know, so I think that they're, um, that that's okay. I haven't gotten any negative reactions for that, but I think you do have to ask yourself what's, you know, is humor a tool in communicating, or is it you just trying to, like, get people to like you or to um force a point where there isn't one or to get a reaction out of folks because i think i find sometimes i'm trying to force a joke or be funny about something and they're just that's not useful and i think that's what that's one of the great things about having a really good editor is they'll cut that out real fast and (laughs) uh save you from yourself uh, in that way but i think you know um there's definitely the relationship element of it as well like I don't um you know like uh, sometimes I'll use like curse words in my writing but I have to ask myself is this you know is this really necessary um or am I taking it out because my grandmother might see it like you know like there's that element (laughs) uh people all these self-help books these days have uh cuss words in the title to kind of get a reaction out of people and I don't know how useful that is either right so you know um as far as humor I think I have to be very careful about it, it just being all attempts at jokes and not anything that's substantial or useful for, for people. But I think it, def- I think if you get, if you're being factual about yourself and your family, the humor is just, is natural. And that's a part of being more objective about yourself and also not being so hard on yourself when you kind of shift into doing what you, what you do and sort of what you've been programmed to do. I think being, being able to laugh at it is a useful tool. So. Thank you. Up next is Matt. Well, thank you so much for this presentation, Kathleen. I was interested in this because I'm writing every week as a preacher. And so that's sort of my context. And um, I don't know that I've really given much thought to triangles in my writing before. So that was a new concept for me. And I really appreciated that. And it had me thinking about 
all the triangles that um, are constantly at work in my writing. I'm in Minneapolis. Minneapolis is burning right now. So there's societal pressure in what I might write about this Sunday even. And um, I'm just thinking about the triangles between what, uh, what, what we might think God wants us to do in preaching, what we might think society wants us to do in preaching, um, and then how to maintain self in all of that. So <laughs> there's, uh, you kind of talked about this in related uh, writing to people who are part of bone theory and then people who are not in that triangle. And I thought that was really kind of interesting. And now I'm thinking about how do I manage that? How do I manage self in the triangle between what society might say, what I think God might say, what I might want to say. I'm curious about your thought on that. Um, what are the ways that you really try to work at maintaining self in the midst of all of the triangles in your writing? Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, I mean, I definitely with preaching, that's like a, an added level of difficulty because you get some of the reaction almost instantaneously or as you're doing it, right? I have the luxury of like hiding or avoiding <laughs> or not looking at people's comments or talking to people about it, whereas it's in your face. So I appreciate the added level of difficulty. Um, <laughs> I don't, you know, I don't know if I have an exact answer for you, but I was thinking about, um, I was thinking about a couple of things, you know, one was just the level of curiosity that you bring to a sermon or to your writing and that, you know, we we're having conversation earlier today in a different meeting about uh, the difference that curiosity can make in work with the clients, you know, and how useful that is for people to have access to somebody who is curious about them and about how the thinking could be useful for them. And, you know, I don't know how exactly how that relates to writing a sermon, but that's just what I thought of, of that. Um, not so much about the content as it is about managing yourself and your own anxiety and the difference that that makes in communicating also, which I'm sure you know, but uh, that's just one thought that came to mind, <laughs> you know, and I think, um, Another thing that I try and do is um, not pay attention to numbers. You know, for me, like I, because I do a newsletter, I have data. I know what percentage of people open something, read it. I don't, you know, I uh, know how many uh, people unsubscribe after I send something. I get an email that says, congratulations, 40 people unsubscribe to your newsletter after you said it yesterday. <laughs> and this many people signed up, right? And so that is useful in some sense, but not useful in others. So I don't know what, what numbers you would be tempted to focus on, but to, to ask yourself, you know, what data is helpful and, and what kind of gets in the way. And that's not something I try and think about. I try and just follow my curiosity. And I think the reality is some weeks that will hit and it will be interesting to people and other weeks it will be interesting to no one but me. And that's okay. <laughs> so I don't know if you're allowed to think of it that way with the congregation, but uh, that's, that's, that's how I think about it. Thank you. Next up is Dave. Hi there. Thank you, Kathleen, um, for, uh, Everything you've said has been really helpful, um, or at least a lot of it, anyway. Um, I'm really curious about your thoughts uh, regarding presenting theory to non-bone people specifically, and walking, how you, how you kind of navigate the importance of being kind of neutral and factual, and also recognizing that for someone to develop an interest in bone theory, they're bringing, uh, they would do that because they imagine it's going to benefit them in some way. They're not necessarily coming to it from a, you know, that sort of neutral space, a more sort of scientifically minded set of curiosity. They're, someone would develop uh, an interest in theory because they think, oh, this will help. <laughs> this will help me. Um, and so when you're writing for a popular audience, how do you kind of navigate the sales pitch? You know, avoid, avoid a, a cheap sales pitch, but, but, you know, kind of staying true to yourself and to kind of the spirit of the theory 
how do you kind of open the door? Yeah, I mean, I think there doesn't have to be a sales pitch because if it's, I don't want to use the word true, but if it's, <laughs> if it's close, if it's pretty, pretty close to being true, there is that universality that I mentioned, right? That if it is ac actually a pretty good uh, theory of human behavior, that people should recognize themselves in the stories, in the description, um, in the ideas, and find them useful. And I think that is what happened so much. It's certainly what happened with me. You know, nobody sold it to me. I was just a little bit curious about it, and it was so useful in my in my own family, right? And so, for me, I don't. The question isn't so much how do I sell it as it is how much do I need to mention that this is a theory? And I thought about that a lot with my book because I definitely wanted to be very honest up front that um, these ideas were not mine and that I was just fortunate to come in contact with them. But also that, and I don't think I did a good job of this, but also that the book wasn't entirely theory, right? I'm sure there are some individual there's individual thinking in the book, you know, and that's my own thing to think about <laughs> how I dress that and how my thinking changes over time. Right. And that it wasn't, um, a summary of the theory. Right. But just that I was introduced to this, these ideas were useful to me. Now I'm going to do my best to communicate sort of how it looks like when I work with people with these ideas. Right. And, um, you know, I think, I think about that in, in my other writing as well. You know, if I'm doing an interview or writing an article, I can't really, you know, I can't really say, oh, by the way, this is from Bowen theory, unless I'm like introducing a certain concept, right, or idea. And I, I have to think about sort of what is my responsibility, um, you know, because of, these are not my ideas and how do I sort of give credit where credit is due. And I think that that's really important. That's a little bit different than the question you're asking, but I, it's something I didn't mention in my talk, I think is important to think about how do you how do you do that when you're only given so many words? And for me, it has been, you know, um, in my newsletter, other places connecting back to other things that Lisa Bowen Center or other places are doing. Uh, but that's that's a, a constant question that I have. But I don't, I, I hope I don't sell it. Maybe I do. If I do, then I'm get, gonna have to get better about stepping back and letting people be responsible for what they do with the ideas. But I don't, um, I don't think you have to do that. Thank you. Okay, I don't see any raised hands in the um, in the queue at the moment. Well, am I am I taking us out? I can do it if I need to. <laughs> I have about three more minutes left. So. Yeah. Well, thank you all for coming. I'm you know feel free to you can go uh, find my email. It's Kathleen Smith writes at gmail .com or ksmith at the Bowen Center .org. You're welcome to email me if or if you have any other thoughts or questions. I'm happy to to chat with you. And uh, you can go to the Bowen Center to subscribe to get info about all of our events, all of our programs, which I would encourage you to stay plugged into. So, and this will be up. Did we record this? We did. Okay, so it'll be up on, where will it be, Jessica? On YouTube, um, at youtube.com slash the Bowen Center and our Facebook page, uh, which is facebook.com slash the Bowen Center. Okay, wonderful. And I think this is the last Thursday night lecture for this year, but they will start up again in the fall and uh, we'd love to have you all for those as well. Thank you. Thank you. Bye everyone.